Well, they're the images that stopped a city and shocked the world. The Grenfell Tower blaze, June 2017. Flames climbing 23 storeys up into the air, killing 72 people. Here in Australia, we've got our own cladding crisis. More than 3,000 buildings are still at risk of a similar inferno. Now, millions of dollars were promised to fix the risk, but it still hasn't happened, including according to an export report. The man who co-wrote this report, Dr Traves Moore, a research fellow at RMIT University, joins me live from Melbourne. A thank you for your time, Dr Moore. I was shocked by your report. I thought Grenville had galvanised all of us into action here in Australia. What's happened? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. I guess the uh, you would think an, an incident like what happened at Grenfell would rapidly shift and change the, the building industry and the regulation uh, and indeed put in place some of the solutions required to uh, address this cladding issue in Australia. However, what we've seen, I guess, is some changes in relation to regulation, some financial support provided, but the majority of buildings with flammable cladding on them in Australia still remain with flammable cladding. So, so we're talking about 3,000 buildings, apartment high rises, it could be a lot of residents affected. Is there a place where these uh, buildings are located, one state more than others? Yeah, so it seems like based upon the, the numbers that we have access to, that the, probably the majority of uh, buildings are in New South Wales and in Victoria and spread out uh, across the, the geographic locations of, of Sydney and Melbourne. Okay, so what's the excuse from officials? You know, if they've got the millions of dollars, why hasn't it been fixed in five years? Yeah, so this is a really complex issue that uh, relates to a whole range of, of issues across the building industry. So what we've seen is that it's not a simple matter of replacing the impacted cladding with safe cladding. There is a process that needs to be undertaken to firstly determine what cladding is on these buildings, uh, what the, the risk level is, and then identifying the appropriate action in terms of replacing that cladding, as well as addressing other uh, safety issues, but also defects issues, which are emerging when these uh, inspections are around the cladding are emerging. Now, the cost to replace the cladding is just one element of, of the process and, and the money put forward by various governments around Australia uh, is able to address some of the buildings, but not all of the buildings. And in fact, there's a whole range of other costs that are um, challenging for the occupants within those buildings to be able to um, undertake the work. The building industry itself mm. has tried to kind of dust its hand of the issue um, and has really pushed this back onto consumers as well as the, the various governments to try and rectify this issue themselves. Yeah, but I don't find that acceptable at all. I mean, if, if you've got, uh, say, two or 300 unit holders in an apartment complex and they've all got to get together with their body corporate, they've then got to get action from a government. I mean, we know the money's there. Uh, we can put troops overseas within a matter of weeks. We can wage war within a matter of weeks and we've got five years here and we can't fix this problem. I don't think that stacks up. No, I, and, and if you're a occupant in one of these buildings or you're an owner of one of these apartments, um, we know from the research we did that there are people who have significant concerns about their safety. It's leading to negative health outcomes. Um, we're being told that there's some people who are suicidal because of the uncertainty around the process, around the costs, around the fear for what might happen um, and the lack of clarity around the, the process. Now, the Victorian and New South Wales governments have been working to put in place a, a clearer structure around this, but clearly it is not happening fast enough for the, the likes mm -hmm. of those impacted people in these apartments. And you're right, we really need to be addressing this because the longer it drags on, the worse the issue is going to get for these occupants who are in these buildings. Uh, we're hearing stories of, of people who have, have just basically had enough of the situation and have sold their, their impacted apartments or dwellings for several hundred thousand dollars less than what market value should be. So this has a wide ranging impact to, to occupants as well as the broader society if, if there is an incident in one of these buildings. I often say in this show, you know, when you've got a, a pandemic or a big issue, government leadership, the higher levels of, of ministers get completely preoccupied with that and all the other important stuff falls by the wayside. This is what this feels like to me. 
uh, that we've had nearly two years of this pandemic and we've ground to a halt. Is there a deadline? You know, do you have a sense that there will be a date this year that there'll be real movement on this issue? Uh, you would hope that they're going to be making progress more quickly than they are. I believe in New South Wales there is plans to, to start that rectification work in the second half of the year. Uh, Victoria is starting to ramp up the work that we have now. I think, though, the, the reality is this is going to take a number of years to, to address the issue. And if we have a look back at mm. previous kind of defect issues, such as the leaky home sagas in, in New Zealand, for example, you know, they're still trying to address that decades after it occurred. So this is likely to be taking a fair bit of time to address. Well, we saw what happened with Florida and that building collapsed too. We can't wait forever. Dr. Travess Moore, you stay across it. I'll do it the same here on Credlin. Thank you for your time. No worries. Thank you for having me.